Welcome to Mohawk Valley Church Online. Man, we're so glad that you're with us today. We have a great service ready for you. We're so excited to be able to worship together with you. And I just want to encourage you one more time as we go into a time of worship as a church, let's give God everything we have and make the most of these next few moments.
are enjoying this time of worship that we can all come and experience God together. Psalm 96 8 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. You know, worship does something that makes us just feel good, doesn't it? It fills our hearts with joy to be able to sing and to worship God, to ascribe glory unto his name. But worship isn't the only thing that does that. So does giving. And so when the Bible says to bring an offering, when we come into the courts of the Lord, I want to encourage you to do just that. You can give in several different ways today. 
We're gonna post the link for you, but you can give online on our website. If you have our church app, you can give that way as well, or you, of course, can mail your gift in. No matter which way you choose, it is my prayer for you that you will make the choice today to bring an offering to God. When we do that, it does something inside of our hearts. When we're obedient to Him, it causes us to align things in the right order that God is first above everything else. I love the saying that says, generous hands are never empty. Let's give with generosity today. And I wanna take your word and shine it all around. But first let me just to live it Then when I'm doing well, help me never seek a crown. My reward is giving glory to you.
you need to know before we get into the Word of God today. First of all, we are so excited to do an MB Cares grocery giveaway at the end of August, and we need your help to pull it off. We'll be giving boxes of groceries to anyone in our community that needs it on Saturday, August 29th. We'll be inviting cars to come drive up and we're going to load their vehicle with two boxes of groceries. This is where you come in. 
We want to invite you to be a part of this incredible opportunity to bless our community and to invite them to come to church in September. We'll be having two packing parties where we're asking volunteers to come to the church and help us pack the boxes so we have them all ready. Those two dates are Wednesday, August the 19th and August 26th at 6.30. We also need help on the actual day of the event. We'll need help loading people's cars, celebrating with everyone who drives in, being a friendly face for them, and directing traffic. If you can help with one, two, or all three of these events, would you text the word SERVE to 315-506-4506. That'll give you back a quick link. Just tap on it, fill it out. You can put in there the, whatever event that you wanna help with and we'll be in touch with you to give you all the details. If you remember back in March, when we were quarantined in our homes, everything was shut down, we created the MVC network where we streamed 12 hours of godly Christian programming on Sunday. Well, we took a break for the summer, but we we're coming back this fall for season two of the NBC Network. Now it's gonna look much differently. We're not gonna be streaming all day Sunday. Instead, we're gonna be streaming on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings. We're gonna have a lot of different shows um, from leadership to women's and kids and everything in between. So you wanna look at the date. We're gonna be launching on Tuesday, September the 8th and it is gonna be great, so um, mark that on your calendar. The MVC Network is gonna be starting season two, Tuesday, September the 8th. Well, we have been in a series, um, Pastor Jared started a series last week uh, titled Influencer. And, and so if you don't know what an influencer is, for those of you that might be a little older in age, it's something that they're calling on social media, people they literally pay to post on, on Instagram and Facebook. Man, who would like that job? Man, you just, you're just going to pay me to post stuff on social? That's literally what they're, they're paid to post on social media and to influence, because they usually it takes thousands of followers to get this job. And they know that this person has thousands, sometimes tens and hundreds of thousands of followers that they want them to influence those followers. So they pay them and they say, hey, influence these people for us to buy things, some, some kind of marketing. And, and so influencer is really influencing other people for, you know, whatever that is. And so we titled this series for this month, Influencer, and you're going to be hearing from um, a lot of our young leaders. And God has blessed us because with young leaders. Amen, church? And we totally, 100% believe in raising up the next generation of leaders. Um, and those can be leaders in the community. It's going to be leaders in the home. All right? It can be um, leaders as pastors or missionaries or whatever it is. We want to invest in that next generation whether it's in kids' ministry, youth ministry, college, we want to invest and pour into them because that is what we have is our, that next generation, right? It's all left up to our next generation. So we need to be pouring into them and giving them opportunity to use the gifts that God has given them. So last week you heard from Pastor Jared, and, and this week you're going to hear from our children's director. And our children's director has been with us, well, he's been a part of this church actually longer than I have. And, and he has um, grown up in this church. Many of you know him, and, and maybe some of you are here when his father pastored our church. And he is here. Could you actually stand up, Pastor? Come on, stand to your feet. Can we give? Come on, let's give. Um, Pastor, a hand of praise. And you know what? I just believe that we are where we are as a church because of the men who have gone before us. And I just want to honor you today. Thank you so much for being here. That we are able to do the things that we do here because of the men who went before us and sacrificed and who, who continued the call of God on their lives. And I believe that the people and the, and the influence and, and, and the multitudes that we're seeing come to Christ 
uh, we owe to the men that have gone before us. And, and his son is actually our children's director. And can we give it up for Cody Burns? He's going to be sharing with us today. Come on up, Cody. Man, we're so glad that you're here with us. And, and believe in the call that God has on your life. And, man, we just love you. Love you, brother. All right, guys. How are we all doing today? I just got to put on my glasses quick. I'm a little old here. So, yeah, as Pastor Mike said, I'm the Kids Ministries Director here. I started here back in January. But I've been going to this church for like 20 years, and it's been a blessing. It's been amazing. And, you know, I'm honored to be up here today. It's an honor whenever you get to just speak the name of Jesus. Amen. It's an honor whenever you just get to just live in the goodness of God and talk about God, you know. Like, I was praying about what to say, and I just felt God telling me, just talk about me. Just talk about Jesus. Talk about the goodness of God. So that's what I want to talk about today. But first, I want to open in a word of prayer. So let's all bow our heads. God, I thank you for just your love and your mercy, God, your grace. Just that you sent Jesus to die for us. I thank you that you saved our souls, God. I just pray your hand over this service, hand over the kids right now, God. I just pray that you're that you just anoint me, that I can speak your word, God, that I can just speak everything that you want me to speak. And in your name, amen. So, I recently have a friend who, her cat died. I know, sad, sad way to open up a sermon, right? But she came to me because she knows that, you know, she knows I'm a Christian. She knows that I know my Bible. So she said to me, do you think my cat's in heaven? And I gave her my answer. Don't be offended, but I told her no. I told her that her cat just doesn't exist anymore. But so, as you can guess, she didn't like that answer. So what she did was she went to the next person. The next person who knows their Bible, she said, is my cat in heaven? And that person told her, yes, your cat's in heaven. And who do you guys think she believed? Of course, she believed the person who told her, her cat's in heaven, because that's what she wanted to hear, right? And I open up with that story because I just feel like in our world today, in our generation today, that there's no such thing as absolute truth anymore, right? It's just whatever you want to believe, it's whatever fits to you, it's all relative to your situation. But as Christians, as followers of Christ, we know that the Bible is the absolute truth. It is the absolute word of God, and it is something we need to anchor our lives around, right? So today we're going to be looking at a verse, and it's going to be uh, Romans 12, 1, for those familiar. And it's going to tell us to be a sacrifice to God. It's going to tell us to sacrifice our bodies to God. And, you know, my goal for this sermon is to really just point you guys to God. I want to point you guys to Jesus and just, honestly, I just want to brag about how good Jesus is, how good God is. So let's read the scripture. It's Romans 12, 1. And it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So for those that don't know, the book of Romans is written by Paul. And, you know, Paul is, if Paul says something, you should listen to what Paul says, right? Paul's he's a pretty big name in the Bible. I mean, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and his transformation is just insane, and God used him in such ways. And if you see here, he says, therefore, I urge you. Do we have it? No, no, you guys have, I plead with you. Same thing. But he says, I urge you, and it's like he's saying, I'm begging you. Like, please, listen to this. This is important. And then he says, offer your bodies as a sacrifice. And I can only imagine what the Romans were reading, or like what they thought when they read this at that time. They were probably like, what? Like, really confused about it. So what are they going to say? They're going to say, why should I offer my body as a sacrifice to God? And if you've ever read the book of Romans, you know, it's really just, it highlights the sacrifice of Jesus. How God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us, that we become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, and our sins are atoned for through Jesus. But he addresses it quickly in this verse. He says, in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. So can we all just take a second right now and just reflect on God's mercy in your life. Just reflect on how good God has been, you know. It's the mercies of God that are new every day. They just lavish on you day by day. The love of God, just his grace that never runs out. You know, it's his love that sent Jesus to die for us, that Jesus came and he died on a cross for our sins. He came and he died a death that we didn't deserve. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve Jesus. We don't deserve to be up here singing the name of Jesus. We're so unworthy, but it is only through the blood of Jesus that we become holy. We become perfect in the sight of God, which is such a beautiful thing. You know, Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life, and he was murdered. He was murdered in the spot of an actual murderer. Like they said, crucify Jesus. And you know that God still loves us. God still cares about us. We don't deserve Jesus. We don't deserve any of that. But it's all a gift from God. You see, God, 
he didn't owe us anything back then. He doesn't owe us anything now, and he'll never owe us anything. But it is, it is out of his goodness and his love and his mercy that he's going to continue to pour blessings on us through our faithful and our unfaithful devotion because our God is good. Our God is good. Like, God could have created us, and then I, I, honestly, uh, I think it's Genesis 3 where we sinned for the first time. So it was like 20 minutes after creation that we started sinning. So God could have just been like, y'all really sinned that fast and just left us. And he could have gone and, you know, he's God. He could have done whatever he wanted. But no, he stuck with us because he loves us. We're his creation. And you see, like I just said, we absolutely don't deserve Jesus. Like instill that in your brains that we don't deserve Jesus. We are, we, I don't know what else to say besides we just don't deserve Jesus. And you see, Jesus, he could have came, he could have died, he could have rose from the grave, conquered our sins, conquered hell, and then ascended into heaven. And then God could have said, okay, you're on your own. Like, the rest is on you. But he gave us the Holy Spirit because God, he loves us. He cares for us. It is all out of his love and out of his goodness that he gives us all this stuff. And you see, everything from God is a gift. We don't deserve any of it, but we owe God everything. We don't deserve to offer our bodies as a sacrifice to God. He's an almighty, holy, perfect God. And it is only through the blood of Jesus that we become worthy. There is no other way. It is only through the blood of Jesus. If you have ever read the Bible, you'll know that a lot of it is countercultural, right? A lot of it goes against what culture says. So sacrificing ourselves to God, you know, that's hard as is. But especially when we live in a society where everything points to making you happy, right? I'm pretty sure Pastor Mike, you preached on this a few weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, that you know, we're not just called to do whatever makes us happy. But society will tell you now, do best by you. Put yourself first. It's really honor yourself. You can't scroll social media for like 20 seconds before you hear someone say, put yourself first today, honor yourself today. But as true followers of Christ, we need to forget all of that. We need to forget what the world tells us and just become radically abandoned to our own desires for the cause of Christ. We need to know what our Bible says and how we need to live. Matthew 8, 19, a teacher of the law went and said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said, let me go and bury my father. My father, Kesha, listen to this. If you listen to anything, listen to this right now. Another disciple said, let me go and bury my father. Jesus replied, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. And these on the surface, these are offensive these are insane remarks by Jesus but you know it's like I see my dad right there and if like I don't know don't take this weirdly but if he died I'd want to bury him like I would want to bury him just because he's my dad you know that we love him but Jesus says no it's like these two people went to Jesus and they basically said Jesus I want to follow you and Jesus basically says no you don't he basically says he's just no you don't and you know, it's because as Jesus is saying, everything you want comes second to God's will. Everything you want comes second to me. Everything in our lives comes second to the will of God, comes second to Jesus. And, you know, it's beautiful how when you truly become a sacrifice to God, how your thoughts, your desires, your motives, everything about you just starts to transform into the mind of Christ, into the heart of God that you know, he just changes us from the inside out, really. And you see, nowhere in the Bible are we called to give some stuff to God and hold on to the rest. I used to pray this prayer. It's ludicrous, but I'm sure I'm not the only one. That I used to pray, God, I'll give you this sin, but I want to hold on to this sin for a little more because I'm not done with it. And as I reflect on that, it's like, what a selfish prayer. Like, what a selfish prayer that is of me. And maybe y'all haven't prayed it, but you guys have thought it. I don't want to give this up to God, but nowhere are we called to give some stuff to God and not the rest. We're called to give everything to God. And, you know, we're not called to halfway Christianity. We're not called to just, because that's really glorifying yourself in the process. Like, it's easy for us to just only look at the promises of God and then just ignore all the verses about suffering. Ignore every verse that, you know, isn't, it's not appealing on the surface. But, you know, halfway Christianity, it's not biblical. It doesn't exist. And it is hard to find the humility to lay everything down at the feet of God. It's hard to find the humility that, you know, you lose control of your life. I was in a group of friends a few weeks ago, and we were just talking about it. And they were just really talking about how hard it is to just want to lose control of their lives for the glory of God. 
you know, if you've given your life to God fully and you've given up everything, become a sacrifice, you will know that you have made no greater decision in your life, right? There is no greater decision you can make than to give it all to God. But once you give up your life to God, you will find no greater reward than Jesus. I promise you that. You will find no greater peace in Jesus and no greater love. You will find, you know, peace that surpasses understanding, love that cannot be matched by anything on this earth. And, you know, I know that it's easy to read this or hear me talk saying we have to be a sacrifice to God and to think that I'm up here saying that we have to be perfect. But, you know, we're not called to be perfect. We're just called to be faithful. You see, it's like the gospel is such a come-as-you-are gospel, you know? It's such a just bring, I'm pretty sure the Statue of Liberty said this, is like bring your tired, bring your poor, bring your sick. But it basically, it fits for this too. And the beauty of the gospel is that it's not a fix yourself and then come to me gospel, but it's a come as you are gospel. And when you come as you are and you give your life to Christ, he's just going to change you in, just in ways that I can't put in words, honestly. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life and convicts you and just points you to Jesus, you are going to change. You're going to become more like Christ, and it is the most beautiful thing. And you see, the transformation that we go through, it's not a destination, but it's a journey. It's a journey that's going to last for our whole lives. It is a journey that is going to last until we walk through those pearly gates of heaven. It is a journey that is never going to end. We can't achieve perfection. And, you know, honestly, that's okay. You know, we need to strive for it. But that's okay because Jesus, the only perfect human, he came and he, he took our spot on the cross. You know, that's a death we deserved. We didn't deserve the Son of God to come down and die a death for us so we could be in right standing with God. We don't deserve any of that. It is only out of God's goodness and God's love and God's grace that all this happened. And when we truly live a life sold out for the cause of Christ, God is going to honor in ways that this world never could. You see, right now, my car, I lease my car, and my car is almost up. It's, I'm in talks with uh, salesmen and everything. And it seems like every car I go to is, like, ridiculously expensive. Who can relate to that? That, you know, I could, like, go look at a $2,000 car, and they still want, like, 600 bucks a month for, like, seven years. But it's easy to think that, like, if I just had this car bought for me, or if my student loans are paid off, or if my mortgage is paid off, that I'd be happy. But that's not the case. You know, everything in this world, everything that this world can offer you is temporary. It's all temporary, and only God is the joy, is the peace, the love that will last for all of eternity. And you see, if you're serving God just for earthly treasures, you're serving God for the wrong reasons. Like, we are, every time we go into our time of offering, they read a verse about tithing. And if you simply follow God only so he will set your finances straight, now don't get me wrong, that is absolutely that happens. Like, that's the truth about God that he does that. But if that's your only reason so that he'll set your finances straight, you're serving God for the wrong reason. We need to serve God and worship God simply because he is God. There is really no other reason to it. He is an almighty God. He is a good God, and he is a loving God. And we worship God because he's God and not for the blessings that he gives us, but it is through our faithful and even our unfaithful devotion that God pours blessings down, us left, down on us left and right. But that's also not to say that you're just going to go through a peaceful life for whatever your lifespan is. 90 years, you're going to go through struggles. That's a promise. And, you know, it's easy to say that at the end of your struggles, or it's easy to think that at the end of this struggle, you're going to receive a blessing, which is absolutely true, which is true. But the blessing you receive, it might not be like a tangible blessing. You know, it might not be that new car or that, you know, extra thousand dollars or whatever. The only blessing you might get might be that you draw closer to Jesus by partaking in his sufferings. And anybody who has ever drawn close to Jesus knows that there's nothing you could ask for. There is nothing better than Jesus than you could ask for. And you see, I love the book of Ecclesiastes, and, you know, I go to it a lot for an example because the guy who wrote this book, Solomon, he had literally everything he could have ever wanted, and he said it didn't add up to God. Like, Solomon is noted as the richest and the wisest person to ever live, and he still said that without God, everything is meaningless. We're going to look in chapter 2, verse 17. And in the beginning of chapter 2, he says that he denied himself nothing that his heart desires. And he bought for himself everything. Like, if you read what he bought, you don't even know what half of it is, but he literally bought everything he could have wanted. Like, today it would have been cars. Uh, what else do you want? Houses. I don't know. The Atlantic Ocean, probably. But chapter 2, verse 17, he says this. He says, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun is grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, the chasing after the wind. 
And if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, remember that he's the richest and wisest man ever, but he sounds depressed. As he's writing this book, he seems like he's really going through it right now. Like he is going through some sort of depression. And you'd also think that the only thing that he knows to say is everything is meaningless. Because he is saying that constantly, everything is meaningless. And just take this as your example, that money can't buy you true happiness. That, you know, whatever happiness you're searching for not in God is not going to last. Whatever happiness, whatever, just whatever you're not anchoring in God, it's temporary. Your joy, your peace, you know, we need to not extol anything to a higher spot than God in our lives. You see, we know we have to put God first, but, you know, it shouldn't even be, okay, God won, family two, like, I don't know, golf three. It should be God one and then nothing even comes close. It should be God number one and then everything else is just gone and everything flows from your walk with God. And when we stand up here and when we sing that there is nothing better than you, right? You guys know that song. There's nothing better than you. There are no truer words that we could sing up here. There are no truer words that we could speak that there is nothing better than God. And you see, the more and more that I seek God, the more I pray for the Holy Spirit in my life, just for God's will in my life, the more I read my Bible, the more I start to understand God, you know? The more I can start to see his love and he starts to reveal himself to me. But the more and more that I read my Bible, the more that I draw closer to God, the more I don't understand God and the fact that how can this perfect and holy almighty God love a broken sinner like me? How can this perfect and almighty God love a broken sinner like me? It is, like we, I could stand up here and I could say, and this is absolutely true, God is love. His love surpasses understanding. God is God and we can't really fathom him with our human mind. That's all true. But really the fact of the matter is I can't put into words how good God is. I can't put into words how good the love of God is. And it's really the love of God that just sent Jesus to die for us on a cross. That, you know, we, we, we just couldn't do it on our own. If you've ever re read Romans, like, it's just again and again, Paul is saying that your works can't get you salvation. It is only through Jesus. It is only through Jesus that we are right with the Father. Ephesians 1 tells us that we're holy and blameless in the sight of God and we have Jesus. When we have Jesus, God sees us as perfect, you know. He sees us and he sees Jesus. What a beautiful thing that is. Like, if you, you need to just reflect on that every day. That through your sin, the God who knows the depths of your heart, how many hairs are on your head, if you are found in Jesus Christ and only if you are found in Jesus Christ, he sees you and he sees Jesus. He sees you and he sees perfection. And, you know, we don't deserve any of that. And we need to reflect on the death of Jesus Christ all the time. You need to never let it be a story that is taken for granted. You know, like I can ask the kids, I can say, you know, what did Jesus do? And they'll be like, he died on the cross. And they'll just answer for candy. You know, they don't really care. But when I ask you guys, it has to be, just, it has to tug at your heart. Just like the comfort. If you've ever read about Jesus dying, it's the most heartbreaking story, but yet the, the most beautiful story you can ever read in your life. So I just want to take a second and I want to read through it. It's going to be a few verses, so bear with me, but it's going to be Matthew 27 and 28. It says, They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Like, that is just the Son of God came down to earth, and that's what we put him through. The Son of God came down to earth, and that's what God's creation and humans put him through. Like, it's just the most beautiful thing that Jesus did this, that he had the humility to just say in that moment, God, forgive them, for they don't know what they do that he was able to just turn the other cheek. You know, he said, I think it was a Caesar or Pilate, that he could have called down legions of angels just to protect him at that moment. And that he didn't. He willingly died on a cross for me and you. It's crazy to me when I think about it this way, that, you know, Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus is the, or was the physical representation of God. So we had God in the flesh. You know, the glory of God was fully manifested in Jesus Christ. He was God walking among us, the only perfect human ever. And it took us 33 years to kill him. It took mankind 33 years to kill God walking among us. And what, what a wicked and perverse people we are. Just, it's only the love of God 
that makes us right. If you're trying to achieve, you know, eternal life on your own, there's nothing you could do. It is only through faith in Jesus and only through faith in Jesus and only through faith in Jesus that we're made holy, that we're made worthy. And, you know, Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death, but it's the free gift of God that gives us eternal life through Christ Jesus. And it is only through Christ Jesus. And really, if you guys remember anything from tonight, I just want you to remember that our God is such a good God. I want you to go home. I want you to spend time with God and just reflect on the goodness of God, the blessings he has poured down from you or poured down on you, that he'll continue to pour down on you, that when you sin, when you knowingly sin, that he still loves you, that he's still running after you. It's still his goodness and his love that is chasing you down. And you know, before I truly came to know the Lord, I searched the world for joy. And I'm sure that's a lot of people's story here, that we search the world for joy. And you know, there's a reason I'm up here talking to you right now. There's a reason that you guys are here right now because we found that there is nothing better than Jesus. There is nothing better than the name of Jesus or greater than our God. You know, I got drunk. I, got, I had a girlfriend that I tried to put at the center and none of it added up. It was all temporary happiness that, you know, when it's done, when you come down, you just feel worse about yourself than you did before. But it's only through Jesus that we are satisfied, you know? There's a longing in our hearts for eternal love, for an eternal savior, for eternity. That is only satisfied through the blood of Jesus. And I want to take a look at Philippians 4.12. It says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And Philippians 4.13 is probably the most popular verse in the world and it's probably the most taken out of context verse in the world. You can only do all this through Jesus Christ. If you're, you're trying to do it on your own, you can't. And there's a lot of people here who, you know, you know this. I know that if you've been to church, I'm not like spitting new stuff at you. I'm not telling you guys new, like groundbreaking things. But there's a lot of us that just have to come back to our first love. We just have to get right with the Lord and just repent. And it's just so beautiful how when you come to the feet of the Father, just broken, just in tears and shambles, that he, that he just restores you. He just restores you in such a beautiful way. And you see, a few weeks ago, I was driving home from church, and uh, I was on that street right over there. It's across from Fast Track. That's it's, uh, that 55, whatever, Mohawk Street. And I was just in my lane doing my own thing, and then this car was coming at me. Like they were passing a truck and they were coming in my lane. And if, and if I was looking down or if I was texting or anything, it would have been a head-on collision and I probably would have died on the spot. And I know, gruesome story, but you know, your trip home isn't promised. Your next breath isn't promised. Your tomorrow isn't promised. Life itself is something we absolutely take for granted. But it is only by the grace of God that you are still here right now. So I want to ask you just, what kind of life are you living? Are you living a life to glorify yourself or just a life to glorify God? And then I want to take it one step further. Let's look at Judgment Day. When you stand before God, what is he going to say about you? What is he going to say about the life that you lived? You know, it is only through Jesus that we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. There is no other way. I was recently talking to a friend and I was telling him about God. And I was telling him how if, like, when, if you have Jesus, when you stand in front of God, you, you know your sins are atoned for. And you don't stand in account for your sins. But we do stand in account for our actions. But then he said, okay, so if I don't have Jesus, I'm just accountable for myself. And he was okay with that. And, but it's just one sin eliminates us from the holiness of God. One sin eliminates us from the presence of God. And we are all sinners. And we are just saved by grace, saved by the greatest name, saved by Jesus Christ, who one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. And, you know, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, you're either going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or you're going to hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. And if you are not found in Jesus Christ, you will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. It is not... It's not fun to be up here for the first time and say that, but that is truth. It's a scary reality that a lot of us have to face. 
And you know, I feel like in society today, especially my generation, hell has become a joke. Like I always hear people say, oh, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to smoke with Satan. I'm going to drink with Satan. But they don't realize that hell is described as weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, you know, the Bible's figurative a lot. Jesus speaks figurative, figuratively a lot. So let's say he was figurative when he said weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it wasn't symbolic. Or it was symbolic and it wasn't real. Well, I just want to ask you, what, do you, what was it symbolic for? What was it figurative for? I recently booked an Airbnb and nowhere in there did it say this place will be on fire the whole time and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is not describing anything good. It is describing eternal torture and eternal deprivation from the presence of God. But you see, for those of us that hear, well done and good and faithful servant. What a beautiful day that's going to be when we just see Jesus face to face. When we just get to heaven, we can truly see the holes in his hands and we're just welcomed with open arms by Jesus Christ. I want to make one last point here and then we're going to finish up. I want to look at how, uh, how the disciples died. You know, the disciples, the 12 that they walked with Jesus, they were there for his crucifixion, they were there for his resurrection. And, you know, because you think that if Jesus didn't really die or raise from the grave and ascended into heaven, you know, if he just died, that they would have given it up, right? They'd have been like, all right, it was just a joke, whatever. But Paul, he was beheaded. And Peter, the same Peter who Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, he was crucified upside down by request because he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord and Savior. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was pierced through with spears. Philip was cruelly put to death. Matthew was stabbed to death. Bartholomew was a martyr. James was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias, who was chosen to take Judas' spot, he was burned to death, and John was exiled to Potmos. This just shows that the name of Jesus is greater than anything. You know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And just the name of Jesus is so much greater than anything this world can offer you. It is so much greater than anything else. So I actually want to make one last point. I lied to you last time. But I want to look at some promises of God. That if you do give your life to God fully, some promises that we have to rest in Him. And now, I don't know the exact number, but there's a lot of promises in the Bible. I'm going to read you two. So I'm not going to do it justice, but, you know, go home and look them up. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You know, it's, I feel like everyone knows that verse, but it's easy to just see the, and he will make your path straight part. But the first part of it, that's three commands followed by a promise. And it's basically saying, become a sacrifice to God and he will guide your paths. When you become a sacrifice to God, when you just give up your life for the will of God, God is going to work through you and he is going to do so much through you. And, you know, I think it's funny for me because if you asked me two years ago what my two least favorite things were, I would have told you kids in public speaking. But, you know, God can just do immeasurably more than all you could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. That just God is going to take your life and he is going to, you know, it's all to glorify his name. And thank you, God, that I get used for that. Thank you, God, that you use me to glorify your name. The blessings you will receive and just the goodness of God that you get to walk in is unmatched. And it is greater than anything this world can ever offer you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for just that you sent Jesus to die for us, God. I thank you for your goodness, for your love, your grace, your mercy. I thank you that you never turn your back on us, that your love is just there for us every day, God, that you just pursue us, that you love us so much, God. I just pray all this in your mighty name, Lord. Amen.